We're going to talk about some pain. Oh, God. Okay. This was the, here. You want something funny, Jeff? When I went and discussed um, buyer's regret, I knew that there would be, you know, like with the topic idea of that, that we would be discussing some tough moments, okay? But seller's regret. Seller's regret, man. That sticks with you. That sticks with you like an infection, like a Newton infection, okay? You're never going to get that done unless you get it, you know, regraded or you get that little piece of paper in there or something. Come on. I'm going to keep bugging you about it. I love it, dude. But seller's regret, it, you never forget it, man. You, I forget books I bought and let go. Like, I'm like, I think I bought. Yeah, I did. What was the grade? You know, seller's regret. I can tell you the grade. I can tell you approximately when it happened. I could probably tell you about the deal and how much, you know, like it's, it never leaves you. And I knew when I posed this question to the community that we would get some examples of seller's regret and it was going to hurt. But in reviewing seller's regret, how many times did you and I just stop and go, oh, that made me think of me, us, Back when insert seller's regret example happened, this hurt us just as much as I think it hurt the community when they typed this out and shared it. Yeah, every comment I read almost related to another moment in time that just brought me disgust and pain. <laughs> <laughs> disgust and pain. <laughs> Comic fam, your seller's regret. We got your stories in. We have your examples here. And, of course, we'll share some of ours because that's why we're here for you. Hit the subscribe button. Let's do this. Big Dude Comics. We're talking about seller's regret when you just wish you still had that book. You wish you didn't sell it. You regret it. He said he regrets selling a lot of Marvel Silver Age comics at shows for 50% off price guide. That's what you had to do, man. You had to. You had to be competitive. People don't want to pay price. You know, you got to give them a good deal. That's what you do. Now, you say you had to do it. You've, you've, you've experienced this. Please elaborate. I've gladly done it. I've gladly done it. To this day, man, even to some books, not all books, and I'm kind of like weary to hit the con floor at this point because I know it's going to be crazy, but you got to give a good deal, especially on books that don't sell very well. You know, sometimes, you know what? I love me some Jonah Hex. I think Jonah Hex is dope, dude. Jonah Hex has movies. But not everybody wants to pay price guide for Jonah Hex. So you got to give him a good deal. You cut it down in half. Yeah, I don't mind making decisions with the proper information that I had at the time. And then I, I know I did my due diligence, right? right? So I was doing what was being done by everybody else. And it was okay and normal. Right. All right. Now, obviously, you look back and you can have some regret, like thinking back. But at the time... I did the best. Now, the regret for me hits hard. Is like, I made a bad choice at that time. Yep. Because there was information I should have known better or I should have followed my gut and instinct. So it's just, uh, that's for me the biggest regrets. You know, making the right decision at the right time with the correct information, I have no problem with that. I sleep well at night. But just not following my gut when I knew it or the information was out there and I didn't listen or look at it. And then I'm just like, oh, God, no one to blame but myself, right? My dad, back in the day, he did his first convention. We've chatted about this on the show. Maybe I'll get him back on to do like another refresh. You know, it's, it's fun to, to, to relive some of these moments in my childhood, right? He bought a comic book store. We, he drove it up to California, and then we drove it up to Washington. And I'm talking like two semis filled with comics. My guest house, my, my parents' guest house, they still have the guest house was filled with comic book long boxes. Like my friends growing up knew me as the kid, their friend who had more comics than they could ever imagine, right? And after deciding not wanting to do a store, he started going to conventions. And the first convention he went to, he just put out all these comics and said, hey, they're all five bucks. You know, he just like, whatever price it was, it was far too little. He didn't put the time into pricing. He didn't put the time into bagging and boarding. He just took out the lawn boxes because at the time it wasn't as like popping as it was. And his training of being in a store didn't teach him about back issues as much as it taught him about running the storefront, fulfilling orders and subscriptions and keeping it clean and managing the space. What would happen is he would put out these lawn boxes and people would buy a lot of comics. Great. And then 
a gentleman walked up. John Hill would walk in front of his, his, his rows of lawn boxes. Shout out Hills of Comics in Auburn, Washington. A dealer that if you've been to a convention, he's there. Hills of Comics. And John Hill, he's a professional. He knows the hell out of his comic books. I look up to this guy. He's family to me, right? And he is somebody who will get a good deal. If he sees the deal, it's going to be his. He's the guy that'll buy the comic book from you because you're like, yeah, dude, 20 bucks, take it. He'll be like, yeah, 20 bucks, you sure? Okay. And I'll come back to your, your, your table like a couple hours later and go, yeah, dude, I just sold it for 100. The guy wanted 100 bucks for it. I just did it. Like He'll flip it and you'll be happy for him because you wouldn't have never been able to flip it for 100. It's because of his network. And this is like a, this is over a decade ago. This is like two decades ago. I was like a teenager when this shit would happen. John Hill, the guy who would secure comic books whenever he wanted to, he would tell my dad, stop, pull them back, get your lids, don't sell. He could have bought those books from my dad and he didn't. And that was the day that a friendship would start. My dad would pull all those comic backs and learn a very valuable lesson that he needed to price his comics. He needed to learn how to grade his comics and he needed to do the due diligence to take care of the collectible because he had more than what was what he thought they were worth. That connection would start a friendship with John Hill. John Hill would introduce me as a, you know, I would, I would grow up with John Hill as a, as a teenager, right? But in my adulthood, he would introduce me to Russ Bright, the comic sensei, who would introduce me to you. He would introduce me to multiple dealers in the community. And it was that moment of gratitude that my dad felt that would really like start this train of us becoming dealers in their entirety. And it started because my dad was selling comic books for like below half of what they were worth. You know what? Talk about an ethical move. Talk about a, you know, a, a dope dealer, right? I'm, I'm very grateful that my dad put those lawn boxes out for 50% off. All right, let's keep it going because we got some more comic love to discuss. Dude, let's get into this next one because Awesome Aranda's over on Insta said this. He regrets selling his Something is Killing the Children comic books. And here's the thing. I'm going to show you another comment. Nathan Settle Mirror 90 said he regrets selling his Sweet Tooth and his Something is Killing the Children comic books. Something is Killing the Children? I'm not even going to show all the comments on today's show. I think we got at least 10 different comments about seller's regret about that run. People believed in that comic book so much that they bought it in mass because they loved it. James Tynan shout out. But I don't think anyone was expecting this title to get optioned as quickly as it did. And sometimes you miss out, man. Sweet Tooth was a dollar comic book. It literally says dollar price on the, on the book. Seller's regret. Sometimes you miss the boat. You sell too early. Well, they sold these books prior to them being optioned. Something Scale on Children is going for near $2,000 at a 9.8. This is a fresh wound. That's why it's it's so new. It's still open, dude. It's that it's that. Give me some trash and let me plug up my wound. Because it's trash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's like you said, pick, you're still picking at this wound. You know, it's that fresh. It's just, ugh, guys, I'm sorry, man. I missed out on it. Does that help at all? Dude, I remember when Something is Killing the Children came out. I was at the shop and you walked in and you were like, you got any Something is Killing the Children? I heard it was hot. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, we got some. And that was it. That was it. I didn't catch on to Something's Killing the Children, really. Like, I read the first couple issues, but I didn't buy them. I didn't put them on my poll list. James Tynan wasn't blowing up the way he is now. It happens, man. I asked for it. I didn't get any. <laughs> yeah, and, and we failed you, man, because we didn't, we didn't make you, you didn't get your copies from us. Like, oh, damn, we should have gotten you some. This next one, The Boy Who Had Seven says, I sold my X-Men 1 six months ago for a third of what it's going for now, throwing up emojis, feeling sick. Tell me about X-Men titles, Jeff. Oh, God. That book has been, what do you call it? In fuego. In okay. fuego. <laughs> Caliente. Just anything, really. So, I mean, oh, God, that book's been so hot. I, uh, I feel for you. I do. And you're correct. Um, but 
they're still out there, man. You might have to pay a little bit more, but it's going to cost you more later. I promise you, this mutant buzz is not slowing down. So, yeah, um, I got to tell you, the things for me when I feel that I've sold something, when I fill that hole again with another copy, granted it costs more, but, boy, I'm able to sleep better. I tell you, man, once it's once you get a copy, it, it, it feels that void, at least in my opinion. We're going for over two hours today. Wow. Comic fam. This is some solid comic book themed content. This is what you're getting with the Bags and Boards podcast shout out. But X-Men 1, yes. Mutant keys have popped like we've never seen before. And I was just thinking about that. Like in the last like decade, we've been getting nothing but X-Men. I think people are primed now for X-Men's reintroduction because they know how hype it was back then when they saw it for the first time, when they saw Hugh Jackman. And yeah, it's kind of phased out. We're probably not going to see much of what the Fox stuff was. But when it gets reintroduced into the MCU, when we start seeing mutants on Disney+, Plus, game changer. Absolute game changer, guys. Everyone's got faith in the MCU, so there's hype on everything because you know they can do it right. Right. We've proven it to you. So, yeah, maybe there's a couple like meh, but I got to tell you, man, there's a lot of wins. So maybe you don't like every mutant, but there's going to be enough mutants there where you're going to be super excited, I'm sure. I'm going to make you read this next one because I know that you have a story a little bit, a little bit to say about this one. All right. This is from Theron Couches. Okay. Spider-Man 300, Uncanny X-Men 141 and 142. So it sounds like he's believing that there's more to the days of future past that has is worth specking on. It may be a little bit till we get that again, just like like the Phoenix saga and things that were just made in the last five years. However, Spidey 300, man, I've owned at least 10 copies of. At least. And I'm talking like 96, 94, 94, 96. Never owned a 98. I tried multiple times. But a lot of 96s, dude. And I sold those for so cheap, man. I remember thinking like 500 bucks was like a good deal for that book. It was at some point. All these deals, these all prices were good at some point. So with this book, yeah. You've owned a Spidey 300 before, haven't you? Yeah, I've owned a Spidey. How many Spidey 300s? At least 20, probably. Yeah, probably. You know, I've been doing it for a while. I haven't had one in a, a quite a bit. They don't but, show up as much. No, but I, before it did get really hot, I did buy a bunch from a, uh, at a show. So I had like five copies. And I remember, gosh darn it. I don't, so I do some pressing, you know, my own, but I don't press many books from that time frame. And I remember putting four in one press at one time. I have this big press. And I managed to F up all of them with the exact same issue. So I took all these copies and I pushed it too hard to where there was a rub on every staple on every book. So that's eight staple rubs. And I lost color. And I was like, no. Eight was, staple rubs, man, yes. all at once. Oh. Dude, how pissed were you at yourself when you opened that up and saw you messed up four different very nice ASM 300s, first appearance of Venoms? I was pretty annoyed at myself at first. And I was like, okay, well, I will never do that again. I just learned a very expensive lesson. And, uh, but they all sold regardless. Yeah, there you go. Did well. They probably sold cheaper than they're selling right now. Probably. Yes. Picardo 2104 says he regrets selling his ASM 300. We have another 300 to talk about a 9.4. So he could get a higher grade copy. And that was before the book blew up and now it's out of reach. This is something that happens. You tend to try to get lower grade books when you can afford them so that you can then possibly upgrade them or possibly, you know, sell them later, add more to the sale so you can get more money in to purchase the higher grade copy. But wait, you sold it and now the book went up too fast before you can secure that high grade copy. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, this is a classic scenario where you have the best intentions, okay? You're yeah, like, you're trying hard, man. You're doing everything right. Yeah, I'm selling my book. Because I want to upgrade it with the best intentions. But then you sell it. And you're like, oh, the right copy doesn't come along. You kind of forget. And the next thing you know, this book gets hot. Whether it's five months from now, six months, a week. Okay? And then you look back like, dang it. Now I'm outpriced yeah. at a higher grade. And I wish I had my old copy. So, yes, I've had that happen. 
Um, I just sold a couple AF-15s beginning of the year. Right. You know? But I, at the time, I sold them, and I'm happy that I still sold them. But again, months later, like literally two, three months later, Shot through up, the dude. moon. Through, through the moon. the freaking moon. It's going to Mars, man. And really anything in the last year, if you sold anything last year, this time, okay, it, you've you got some regret. Yeah, if you ever pretty much any it. big key that you've sold in the last year prior to the prices that are happening right now, you're gonna feel uh, you'll be able to relate to what some of our members, including Pick Hardo, has just shared with us. The pain is real, just like with Jeremy Conrad four four zero. He said he sold his two copies of Walking Dead one two months before the show started. Side note. What's going on with Walking Dead 1? Why is it selling for near 4K? It's like a $3,500 book right around there. What was our note on there? Yeah, 3800 bucks. 3800 for a 9.8? That was a $2,000 book at its prime during the show. Yeah, it was. I mean, it hit higher highs than that. And then it even went below 2K. I had someone try to sell me one for 1700 at one point. What's going on, dude? I don't know. I mean, I'm not keen on The Walking Dead. Maybe we should ask Ryan. I know he's really big on <laughs> he that. He loves show. Walking Dead. Show. You know what I'm talking about. Ryan started the fire! Shout out, fire guy. But, you no, know, I mean, yeah, I feel you with this one. I mean, Walking Dead 1. Walking Dead 1 was, like, one of the first big keys that I got that started the, you know, adulthood collecting. I was really hyped. I wanted to get into collecting. I saw, I'm like, oh, you know, I kind of got that bug. It would be kind of cool to own a comic book, an expensive comic book. I was working at the bank. I had extra income. I was like, why not? I bought a Walking Dead one at, um, and it was signed by Robert Kirkman. And at the time, I'm like, oh, it's signed by the creator. Why not? I paid, I want to say it was under $300 for it. It was like 260 bucks, 230 right around there. And because of me being naive and just not knowing, I went to... Uh, the local comic shop that I had just started uh, a, a pull list at. And I got it graded through CGC. And she told me, it's like, hey, it's going to come back a green label though. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. Sure. And I got it graded. And I should have gotten it graded through CBCS at the time. Shout out CBCS. Because they will authenticate the signature and give you a just a blue label, normal book. Uh, well, rather, a, the yellow version of it. Authenticated signature. It came back a green label 9.6. Russ Bright. This dude that I was introduced to, I don't know, within a year of that time, he'd be like, yo, dude, I bet I can get you at least 500 bucks for that book. It's a bummer. It's a green label. And we sold it for like 550 bucks. I kicked him some cash. And yeah, I got out of it. I made a couple hundred bucks. But damn, do I regret selling that 9.6? I wish I would have just CBCS that bad boy. Yeah, I, look, I think you probably made the right move. It's a show. About zombies, and you kind of sold it off of the hype, I'm assuming. That's yes. why you let it go. That's why I did it. Okay, no one was going to expect that show to be what it was. So I'm sure you made a good move at the time. You had the information. You're like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm selling on hype. But, Jeff, but here's the thing. It. You know what I put that money into? Another comic, right? A couple comics. There you go. Invincible Ones. Oh, the Larrys? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get the Larrys. No, okay. Oh, shout out <laughs> comic fam knows what i'm talking about if you're uh if you're up on the larry's editions of invincible it's just like a funny thing you just said but um but no no i got first prince invincible ones because i was getting hyped on that kirkman goodness i was like walking dead's great but dude you need to read invincible i was like going to like uh, every break that i could take at the bank i would go to the little sushi belt they put me in the back of the you know the back of the uh restaurant so i can be you know, get some quiet so I can read comic books. They're like, oh, this this guy, he just likes coming in here with his, I had like an Omni. You know, the, the, mm. it wasn't even really an Omni. It was like the biggest port, whatever graphics I could get. I had the Walking Dead compendium. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know, it's like black and white. Yeah, yeah. And it's like uh, paperback. But then I would also bring my Invincible in there and read that too. And it's like, yeah, put that guy in the back. He likes to eat a lot of sushi and read his comic books. But yeah, Invincible 1, man. We're going to get to that here in a second because that seller's regret for Walking Dead Led to more sellers' regret with Invincible 1. Mind blown. All right, here we go. Comic Geek Manias. He said this in a response. He regrets selling several collections when he was younger because he needed to eat and pay bills. Here's the thing, man. Off the cuff, do you agree with this seller's regret? Because I personally don't. No, 
No, no, no, no. I, no, I, no. Okay. Uh, why? Why do you not agree with this? I want to know if this is something that we that that we uh, see eye to eye on with this one because I don't think it's the seller's regret. No, you can't regret eating, <laughs> surviving, and living and paying your bills. No, you know? man. So you know you did what you needed to do, and there shouldn't be any regret in that. Um, so yeah, I'm absolutely. You know, I, I think you made the right choice is what you did. I think so too, man. I think that when you can look back on difficult times, we've all been there, comic fam, and you were able to get some aid because of some expensive paper, I think that is an amazing thing. It's like an optimistic thing right there. That is like you were able to rely on the collectible. You were able to rely on that, that on the medium. It helped you through a time. Don't regret that. Comic books became your saving grace. Hell yeah. Comics are awesome. That should, if anything, make you kind of feel proud that you're part of the community because it got you through something. I have been there, comic fam, and I look at those moments with, with pride because you know what? The comic books helped. And what media, like, what other things in like the day to day do people get into that really you can, you can rely on that? Like something that you're so passionate about. But at the same time, you can rely on in that way. I can't think of many things, man. Yeah, I mean, I know just a couple people off the cuff who, be, through this pandemic, right? They they collected extremely heavily, and it's because they had a comic collection, they were able to survive through this. And they they said themselves, I've talked to them. They said, "Thank God, I had my comics to rely on." Thank God for the comics. Now, does it hurt at times? For sure, but. That's a different type of pain, you know, li- not surviving on or feeding or living or paying your bills. That's 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 a more of a shame that you don't really want to deal with. Right. Well, let's get back to some of the ones I heard. <laughs> Stampede 21589 says he traded his Daredevil 1 8.5 off white to white pages and a few other books to get a Batman 2 5.0. I just miss it. Ouch. Let's get into that, man. Tell them the numbers. Yeah, I mean, DD1 obviously has exploded, and Batman 2 has not. Still, <laughs> <laughs> It's like one of those things where you're like, you know what, I'm going to get the 2 because it gets you closer to the 1. And, yeah, let me tell you guys. Yeah, just, break, break down the truth here. Yeah, let's break down the real truth, okay? When you buy an issue like Batman 2, it has not gotten you any closer to a Batman 1. <laughs> Just so well you realize put, that. You're no closer to that bat one. <laughs> you buy an action two. It has not gotten you closer to an action one. You, you think it is because the sequential numbering may be. No. You're nowhere near it. Just as close as a Spidey 128 has gotten you no closer to a Spidey 129, right? It's true. Okay. There's a little different comparison. A little more relatable. Okay. Right. So anyways, Batman 2. Great. Cool. Cool book. Dude, freaking awesome book. Love it. Golden Age. Good for you, man. Okay, thank you. I would love a Batman 2. But a Batman 2 um, at a 5.0 is around 10-ish K, maybe 11 K or so. Yeah, maybe a little more. But a DD1 and an 8.5 right now. That's a hot book, man. This year. Whew. 27 to 30, maybe? I think, maybe? Th- I think it'll hit 30 really soon if it isn't already, man. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you, you you missed the boat on that one. I feel yeah, it hurts. Okay, it hurts. It hurts, man. I've had so many opportunities to get a freaking Daredevil one, and I didn't do it. And I always told myself, I'll get it later. I'll get it later. Dude, I don't think I'm gonna be getting any Matt Murdock, Foggy Nelson, or Karen Page anytime soon. Yeah, and and listen, Stampede. If you take anything from this conversation, don't sell your Batman 2 for a Daredevil 2. <laughs> 8 5, because that's still not close to Oh, no. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Mr. Couch Soka said, mint copy of an Hulk 181, giant size one, and a full run from 94 to 130 with the first dozen near mints in 1985. He let go his X keys, his runs. And he did it before I was even born. So he's been living with this frustration for nearly 35 years. Oh, God, that just gives me a headache. It's, it about it hurts, so dude. painful. And he put near mint mint. Like he, he could have said VF near mint. He could have said near mint. He could have said near mint plus. Now he said near mint mint in his head, regardless of the reality that he's living in. Those were Minty Fresh. It's your boy, Jim Mint. <laughs> man, Mutant Keys, man. It's come up a few times on the, on this podcast itself. We have Mutant 
key regrets. I do. I have a lot, dude. I, I got, dude, I sold my Hulk 181 raw twice. Hulk 180 three times. Way too little. Hulk 181, nine, six for way too little. I live with it every day. I, I, it, it's terrible, man. I'm going to have to live with it like you're going to live with those damn Newton rings. I think I gave to the mystery mail call Giant Size X-Men 1 you did. once or twice. You did, dude. And a Hulk 180. You did. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just in the last year. Uh, ComicTime101.com. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. I feel for you, man. But it happens. At least it was back in the 80s, you know, like because you really didn't know. No, you and you would have had to wait so long. You, you know? probably would have sold them in the 90s anyway. Yeah, because there, would have, there would have been an uptick and then you'd be complaining again, you know. So yeah. it's, it's, you know what? It is what it is. At least it wasn't last, you know, like two years ago. All right. Nelvis Eats. Back in 420. He knows the damn date. April 2020. I sold a Transformers 1 for $35 and it was minty first print. I don't know why he would have done that back then. That book is tough and high grade, man. I remember for an entire year, I hit the con floor and it had to have been 2017, 2018. I had a buddy who was like, dude, I need a 9-8 Transformers 1. And an entire year, it was in my mind that like as soon as I find a 9-8 Transformers 1, I'm buying it. And I'm going to find it and just buy it because he told me what he wanted. And I'm like, oh, we can get it for you. That, that's, someone's going to be happy when I buy that from them. And I want to hook up a dealer. And for an entire year, there was no Transformers 1 at 9.8. I found 9.6s. I find high-grade copies. I found them. I found them. I found them. No Transformers 1 at 9.8 for an entire year. San Francisco, New York, WonderCon, freaking Emerald City, Emerald City again. Nothing. Transformers 1 has blown up, dude. 80s nostalgia has blown up. More than ever. And it's because of that 30-year cycle, man. Kids from the 80s, they're after their Thundercats. Kids from the 80s are after their G.I. Joe. They're after their Transformers. Yeah, I probably would have sold that book for around there, but not really knowing. Because I, I haven't always applied value to a Transformers one. Because, again, it wasn't, it seemed, you know, something that's, you know, reobtainable if I had to. So I, I get selling it for that. I maybe mean, if it was like VF or something, maybe. But like, I mean, geez. I just found one, man. I had no idea. I'm going I, through a what, box and it looked really nice. How do you if you're stand. finding Transformers ones, Jeff, right now? What are you doing? I don't know. I had to get past all my um, Thundercat ones and oh E-Man my gosh. ones. <laughs> and then after that came the Transformers ones and then all the G.I. Joe 9 8. And then what's this? Crow, 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 nine, Cerebus eight. 1, Cerebus, no big deal. Yeah. Oh gosh, TMNTs. I only have second prints. Sorry. Just Sorry. Just, no, only man. high grade. I just happened to find one. I was like, oh, okay, because I have a lot of back issue stuff. Sure, right? sure. And you got, and I not very good at organizing it. So I end up going through it like a hundred times all the time. So um anyways, just got lucky. Excited to know that's a cool book. So now, you know. We'll see what happens. I'll send a CGC. I'll see it, you know, maybe when Transformers are real. And by then. <laughs> <laughs> Next one on the list, we have Polo Hermano, 27. I like that name. He said he sold his two copies of Invincible 1 a couple years ago for 10 bucks a piece. That's rough. I went ham on Invincible 1, as I mentioned on this very show. Smart move. It was a smart move then. And then I didn't keep them. And then even knowing the animation was coming, I didn't throw down the money with how much I believed in Invincible. I not only regret selling it, I regret not buying it again. I've gone full circle buyers, sellers regret. Yeah, see, that's the reality of what's going on. That's what I call that. The full circle. Like a Newton ring? It's like a Newton ring. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Just like the Newton ring. No, but look, that's the problem with right now. There's so many books you could have put your money into. You just true. can't put in all of them, right? That's true, man. I mean, there's how many sure things you could have put your money into anyway, outside of Invincibles. You could have put into an X-Men one, low grade. You could have put into a DD one, right? Right. So it's just, oh God, you just, every time you look at something, you're like, oh, I could have bought that. Oh, I could have bought that too. So, man, yeah, I get it, dude. Oh, it's tough. You had multiple copies. You got in early. It was the animation. That's what held me back. I'm like, oh, it's I like that show, man. I loved it. I freaking love. I'm so hyped, man. What's Invincible One Nine Eight going for right now? 
We wrote it down, dude. We I were did. both stunned. Do you want me to tell you? Just t- tell it to the community. Do you remember even? It was an or best offer. We verified the uh, best offer based yeah. off the site, and I couldn't believe my freaking ojos. I still can't believe it, but peep this, man. A 9-8 went for 7K. $7,000. What is happening? All right, the next one. We have Catchy Comics sold my sign 9-4 X-Men 100 for $650. A week later, it sold for 900 and only climbing. Have you ever sold a comic and within the same week regretted it? Same week, dude. I'm not talking like a month or two months or five months or, oh, I had that a year ago. I'm talking like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Yes, let me tell you. I'll explain to you real quick. Do it. When you're on a con floor... All right, at SDCC, they announce a lot of things during that con. But when you're stuck in a booth with no reception, you have no idea what's being announced. So That happens, dude. That's a good point, And that's happened a lot in the last 10 years. Some dealers get frustrated with me back in the day because because I found out and I'm like, Mandarin, you know, I got to find this, I got to find this, or, or whatever it was. You know, whatever the announcement was in Hall H, I found out, I ran, you got this, you got this, you got this, I'm buying and buying and they're like, wait, ah, did it just come up? F. I'm like, ah, oh, are you sure you want to sell it? Yeah, it's fine. And they're pissed. <laughs> yeah, Patents. that's exactly it. You get to that situation, you don't know. And like in the last 10 years, because the MCU's been so strong, it's become such a um, such a prominent thing amongst people running to booths to pick up books. So I've had multiple experiences where like all of a sudden someone buys a random book, like, you know, first Groot or you know, Guardians of the Galaxy characters, a Rocket Raccoon appearance, right. 271, Hulk 271. Who the hell knows? Nobody cares. First, you know, uh, Marvel Superheroes 13, you know, Carol Danvers stuff. So it's just these keys that have always been low and cheap, but all of a sudden someone buys them. You don't think anything of it because it's just another book being bought out of your boxes. But hey, something just got announced. Mr. Danny Arroyos sold a 7.0 ASM1 in 2000 for 6K. He should have never sold it. Is that worth more now? Yeah. It's gone down. Oh, it is. Six thousand dollars for a seven point <laughs> It hasn't I'm gone down. No. Come on, brother. Seven zero. It's like twenty five k. More, my friend. What? Thirty two k. Ooh. Okay, but here's the thing. In the year two thousand, six k for a seven point zero. That's not bad, dude. Yeah, I don't think that was that bad. That sounded pretty good. That sounds good to me, man. You know what? And sometimes, when you're when you're you know, doing books like that, like you would have had to wait 20 years, 21 years for that to peak. You would have held on to that for a long time. And with inflation, just, just showed you with inflation, actually, like literally, you know, that 6,000 means a little bit more now. Yeah, I would think off the top of my head, a 7 0, just guessing. I mean, that book's really spiked of late, like late, late. I would think back in 2018, you know, you, you, you probably could have got that book still at a 7 0. Or close to that. Right. right. Probably a little bit more, but we're not talking much more. I think the last two years have been incredible. Yeah, it's prob- probably maybe the last four years. You did good, man. In 2000, I think that was good. I think he's pretty good, man. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at this next one here. We had a lot of them. Comic Fam, are you with us? We're going long today. I like it. I'm feeling good. Let's keep this rolling. He sold a Star Wars 42 9.8, Avengers 8 5.0, Tales of Suspense 52 and 6.5, all in December 2020. Everything is 3 to 4x now. We're talking Boba Fett 9.8. We're talking Kang. We're talking Tales of Suspense 52. First Black Widow. Black Widow looking gorgeous on that cover. Kind of weird, you know, she doesn't look like herself, but she's definitely there. Yeah, I mean that's that that is the uh, basically the the point in which things started to take a turn and shoot up. Next one on the list is Sub Violacious. He actually is a member of our community. We appreciate you. And what does he have to say? My first CDC graded book, a Hulk one eighty, came back nine zero. Kudos, by the way, and your first book being a key like that come back nine zero. That's a great win right there. Sold for four hundred six years ago. Great price for a book. Like that six years ago, I think so, right? It's, I mean, again, Hulk 180 did not peak the way it has until recent years. Yeah, it didn't get the love that it, you know, kind of is getting now. That's that it deserved. Sure. I think it's deserved the love it's getting. You're right. Now. You're right. Deserved. Deserved. Say it, brother. Say it how it is. It's Joe Cola 570 said he sold his Marvel Spotlight 
five CGC 9.0 white pages for $1,100. All right. Now, he had a 9.0. You traded your 9.2. What did you value your 9.2 at today that, that you traded? Yeah. I mean, the last GPA sale was 18K. 18K. Yeah, man. I feel that one. I definitely feel that one. But a 9.0, a 9.0 sells for 8K. Oh, wow. Is it really that big of a difference? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. That black cover, dude. It's so tough. Well, I sold my 9.4 last year around March for like 4,500 or something like that. So I don't even oh, want man. to speculate what a 9.4 sells for. That sucks, dude. Yeah. That 9.4 is one. That's some, you know what that is? Yeah, I do. Some seller's regret. Pop Culture Guy 22 says, I needed money about six years ago. So I sold my Hulk 18175 for $6,000. I think about it every day. I think about my 7.5. I think about my 9.6 more often than I would like. But again, you know, we just mentioned it. If you needed money, your comics were your saving grace. Don't look at that as a, as a regret, man. Dude, that is a huge win. You sold that book okay. six years ago at 7.5 for 6K. That's a good deal, dude, because I, damn, dude, I did not sell my 7.5 for that much. That sounds more like buyer's regret for somebody else at that point. I mean, yeah, like, at, that's at a that big time, sell. That's a big sell. 6K? I mean, a 7.5 right now is around 8K. It's not that much comeuppance right now. No. All right. Johnny Storm 777 says, I sold my giant size X-Men 8.5 in September of last year, and I'm crying whenever I watch your videos. I've had giant size over seven times in my adulthood. I don't even know what, how many my dad had. I know he had some. That book has never been looked at the way it has in the last couple of years. The second full appearance of Wolverine. The first appearance yeah. of a new team. That's really what it's at. Mm -hmm. It's a thick book. It's a tough book in high grade. Yeah. Um, you're going to feel that 8.5. It's not going to get better. I, I don't feel like you are going to have that seller's regret heal. But those wounds are going to be fresh for quite a while as we lead into the uh, the new years of the mutants being incorporated into the MCU. Yeah, that's that's something that's... Not going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> well, let me tell you about seller's regret. Says one nugget. One nugget. I sold an FF48 9.0 when COVID hit and I lost my job. Okay? Sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. But at least books were there for you. I got 4600 for it. It's now around 17 k FF48, man. This book bugs me. It really does. Does it? Why does it bug you? Because I've had so many of them. Yeah, I get it. It's not I believed in Silver Surfer so much for so long, and I just let him go too quick. And I had incomplete copies too. I have ones with like pages missing, green labeled versions. Russ has a green label right now mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Like I don't know what he's doing, but he, he got a he got a green label one. How many times have you owned an FF forty eight? Quite a few. I, I I sold quite a few, and then I finally got one, and I was like, okay, I have to keep it now, you know, because again, I don't want to regret more selling it. And not having it. And number four, too, Silver Surfer 4. How many Silver Surfer 4s have you had? I've never owned a Silver Surfer 4. Okay, so that's an easy answer right there. Zero. <laughs> I, that, that's one that I'm like, I'm kind of irritated that I've never owned one, but I'm also glad I've never sold one. Right. Okay. Yeah. What about Silver Surfer 1? Uh, low grade. Low grade. Super right. low yeah. grade. Yeah. Tough book, man. It, it is. It is. Like the Silver Surfer 1s, I mean, those were readily available. For a long time. For a long time, right? For hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And so, again, books that were opportunity that I let go and- you know, FF48, it's a cool book. And there's a, there's a lot of that book. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty common book. But again, the demand's so high, man. Everybody wants one. I believe there's still, to this day, more 48s on the census at 9.8 than there are 49s. I by, could be quite wrong. a bit. Right, quite by, a bit. By quite a bit, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going crazy, comic fan. We're two hours and almost 40 minutes in. What's going on? Elizabeth Scott. Ah, oh, seller's regret. I sold my 6.5 X-Men 1 about 15 years ago for $960. Thought that that was a great price at the time. No one knew, man. No one knew about the blue chip takeoff that was going to happen. The market moves so quick. It moves quick. But that's why we're here for the comic fam. Don't let these wounds fester. It's going to be okay. You just got to get your head back in the game. Keep the hunt strong. Be savvy with your buying. Any words of advice for the collector's golden age guru? Absolutely. Keep your eyes open. Keep all your options open. Get your, let everybody know you collect. 
Um, get as many pieces as you can for reasonable and have those available to sell and trade so that you can either fill that void of regret with another copy of that book because I promise you it will ease that pain. Will. It will. Or put it into something else. Comment, like, and subscribe. We're going to come back to the mic, talk about grading in a couple of weeks. We want to hear your grading stories, the good, the bad, the ugly. We appreciate your time today, comic fam. Geek responsibly. Enough said.